right, welcome everybody. I'm going to call the MPOJC Urbanized Area Policy Board meeting to order for July 2nd, 2023. Uh, the first item is recognizing alternates. Yeah, uh, we've got Stephanie Gaughan here from University Heights for Louise Fromm. And we've also got a new board member, Greg Schmidt, uh, from the University of Iowa. So Aaron Shane um, took a new job and is no longer with the University of Iowa. So Greg has been appointed by the president to sit on this board. Um, I did want to thank Greg for, for coming and obviously being um, on our board, as well as Aaron for the work she did. She was on the board since 2019, did a really good job for us. And then just a, a personal thanks. I work with her a lot just in my day-to-day -day operations, and uh, Aaron was always a pleasure to work with. So thanks to her, thanks to Greg, and thanks to Stephanie. Another alternate here. Oh, I'm sorry, Lisa. I'm sorry, I was looking right at you, too. I'm here for Red Sullivan. Yeah. I'm sorry, Lisa. Okay, great. Uh, the second item is uh, considering approval of the meeting minutes from our last meeting. Uh, may I have a motion on that? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any discussion. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Um, and the next item is setting the next board meeting date, time, and location, tentatively September 20th, but Kent may have other thoughts. Yeah, we'll uh, to be determined on that. So we, I would say about half the time have a meeting in September just based on whether or not we have uh, sufficient agenda items, and about half the time we do not. Um, currently, it's looking like, like we will not have that meeting in September, but if we do, uh, please just pencil in your calendars the 20th, um, and of course, you'll hear from us. Uh, the next board meeting after that we will for sure have is about mid-November. So you'll 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 hear from us one way or another. That's League of Cities is happening that Wednesday, Thursday, okay. and Friday. So I know that at least I won't be here. Okay. It may work out well for us if we don't need it then anyway. All right, good. Uh, the, the next item is public ad uh, discussion of any item not on the agenda. Is there anyone here? from the public who would like to speak. Not seeing anyone. Uh, and so the next item is under administration. Uh, consider approval of a method for apportionment of Federal Transit Administration Section 5307 Transit Operating Funds for Iowa City Transit, Coralville Transit, and the University of Iowa CAM bus. Yeah, thank you. So my apologies uh, for the late handout. The memo was sent out uh, about midday yesterday rather than being in the original packet. Uh, we were still working on the item. Uh, if you didn't receive it or didn't have time, there should be a copy of that memo uh, at your seats as well. Um, so as the designated recipient of FTA uh, transit funds, specifically our 5307 funds and small transit intensive community funding, uh, the funds are then allocated annually by this board to University of Iowa CAM bus, uh, City of Coralville Transit, as well as Iowa City Transit. Uh, the funds are used for transit operating and capital expenses, uh, and the allocations uh, for FY22 uh, equal just a little bit more than $4.5 million. For more than 10 years, and I would say probably more like 15 or 20, but I couldn't put my finger on it, uh, the MPOs used the same formula to distribute the funds based on prior year transit statistics. <laughs> Uh, from each of the three systems. Uh, the criteria are 25% operating and maintenance costs, 25% locally determined income, 25% revenue miles, uh, and then 25% fair revenue. Uh, Iowa City Transit requested a review of the formula because they will go fare free as of August 1st is my understanding. Uh, and just a note as well, uh, University of Iowa Canvas has never charged a fare. Uh, they have a fee but they have not received uh, credit for that portion of the formula because again, they have not had a fare. Um, although the percentage and allocation to each of the systems has fluctuated over time, uh, a review of the past allocations, which is attached in your memo, shows that year-over-year -year changes are relatively small. Uh, we're talking 1% to 2% um, at most. Uh, after discussions with the transit managers, the consensus was to simply adopt a fixed base percentage uh, allocation, so starting with FY23 funding, which we'll actually allocate next January, uh, and extending through FY27 which happens to be the end of the transportation legislation, uh, the federal legislation. Uh, so the, the idea is to use it during that time frame based on a historic average and then to review those percentages if and when uh, necessary. So I have in the memo um, examples would be routes or operations cost change. Um, but as a point of clarification, I'm going to talk to several of the transit managers about this. It really could be anything. It could be the fact that a community wants to start charging a fare again. It could be that 
uh, their ridership triples, you know, whatever those, those things may be. Um, attached in your memo are the FY22 statistics, as well as the approved funding apportionment, which this board would have approved last January. Um, as well as a history of the allocations for reference. So after review, the three transit managers unanimously recommended using uh, the fixed percentages to apportion uh, the federal funds at uh, Coralville at 16.1%, Iowa City at 60.51%, and CAMBUS at 23.4%. So again, next January, uh, if approved by this board, we would bring that back to you and then allocate a um, little bit over $4.6 million because we have more federal funds next year uh, than we did this year. Uh, just as a note, uh, we do not hold a TAC <coughs> meeting in July. So normally the TAC uh, committee, the um, technical advisory committee would meet before this board uh, a week before, but we don't do that in July because they don't have any agenda items. So this did not go through the TAC, but was unanimously recommended by each of the three transit uh, managers. And that's why the memo came out a little bit late. We were still meeting and, and discussing that. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Uh, if none, staff is requesting approval of the proposed fixed percentage allocation uh, until further notice. Any questions for Ken? Um, you mentioned that the ne this next year's allocation is a little higher than the last fiscal year apportionment. With Iowa City's being the one that's um, going down, <laughs> do you know if that will result in an actual like net decrease in the amount of funding. What I'm trying to, the real question is, will it be a surprise or will there, you know, will it be, um, yeah, will yeah. it be a reduction? Yeah, I I don't know the answer to that, but it will not be a surprise because I know Darian Negelkam, who's the transit manager, has been crunching numbers for quite a while. Um, I don't think it'll be a reduction. I think it'll still be um, more funding than you had the last year. So um, just to be totally clear, they had the they have the new allocation number when they approve these percentages. Correct. Okay. Got yes. It. Yes. They Thank know you. how much funding we'll have next year. That's correct. Got it. I don't have that number in front of me, but I I think they still increase, and if they don't, it's essentially flat. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Ken, I believe these figures add up to one hundred point zero one. One. They do. Yeah, and it's just rounding. So when we actually break <laughs> that down, we'll carry them out uh, basically as far as as Excel will take us. Good catch, John. Yeah. <laughs> Saw that too. Okay. If there aren't any other questions, I'll ask for a motion. I'll move that. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we, we move into the transportation planning category now with um, the first item being consider approval of amendments to the adopted MPOJC 2050 long range transportation plan. Thank you, Emily Bothell, Senior Associate Transportation Planner. So at your March meeting, the policy board approved the allocation of $9.3 million in surface transportation block grant funding for fiscal year 27 and 28. The approval was contingent on an amendment to the MPO's long range transportation plan to include Coralville's Dubuque Street Northeast and Forever Green Road project, which received $675,000 of that funding. This is because any project that receives that STBG funding is required to be included in the long range transportation plan. The city of Coralville proposed the following amendments to add their project while keeping the road and bridge project list fiscally constrained, which is a required component of long range planning. And the plan only includes those projects that can realistically be completed based on anticipated revenues in our metro area. The amendments include the removal of project number 27, which is the Oakdale Boulevard extension in Coralville. This is a 0.6 mile extension of Oakdale Boulevard west of Jones Boulevard with a total project cost of $2,465,000. Coralville is constructing this project with local funds this summer due to the new Clear Creek Amana Elementary School there. Um, so because that project does not have any federal funding in it, it does not need to be included in the long range transportation plan. 
Project number 30, which is the Highway 6 and New Heartland Drive intersection, will be moved to the 2022 to 2030 illustrative project list. This is for the extension of Heartland Drive to create a new intersection with Highway 6, and the total cost is $1.74 million. This project um, per Coralville will not be constructed in the near future, and so when and if um, it will be constructed, that can be added back into the plan um, or added in the, the next update of our plan, which will be roughly 2026. The final amendment is to add the Dubuque Street Northeast and Forever Green Road roundabout project to the 2022 to 2030 fiscally constrained road and bridge project list. The total project cost is $2,645,000. So to summarize, Coralville is removing two projects from the long range transportation plan that exceed the cost of their uh, uh, Dubuque Street and Forever Green Road project, which they are then adding to the plan. And this will keep the 2022 to 2030 road and bridge total project costs in the green so that we won't be in the negative. Um, we published a 30 day public comment period for the proposed amendments in the local media and we notified interested parties. The public was also invited to discuss the amendments in person. And to this point, we have not received any public comment on this item. Today, we are asking the policy board to consider approval of the amended pages of the long range plan, and those are attached to the memo for your reference. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions for Emily? Okay. I will entertain a motion on that, please. I would move the amendments to the long range transportation plan. Mm -hmm. I'll second that. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next item is under transportation planning is public hearing and consideration of resolutions of adoption and certification for the fiscal year 2427 MPO JC transportation improvement program. Anna. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hannah Neal, Associate Transportation Planner. Um, like John said, this is the final FY2427 Transportation Improvement Program or TIP for the board's approval. Uh, the TIP is the programming document for all surface transportation projects that receive state or federal funds, including street and highway, transit, rail, bike, and pedestrian projects in the Iowa City urbanized area. MPOJC submits the TIP annually to Iowa DOT to document the status of local transportation projects using state and federal funds. And to utilize these funds, projects must be in the TIP with an accurate scope and funding source. At your May meeting, you approved the draft TIP project list. This included a transit apportionment, which you approved at your January meeting. MPO received roughly 4.6 million dollars in FY22 FTA section 5307 operating assistance funds and these funds were apportioned to the three transit agencies using the FY2019 formula like Kent was discussing earlier. The TIP also includes three new surface transportation block grant or STBG projects that were awarded funding earlier this year by the board at your March meeting. Uh, just as a review, the following three STBG projects were programmed in FY27, uh, Coralville's Dubuque Street Northeast and Forever Green Road roundabout project for $675,000 in STBG funding, North Liberty's South Dubuque Street reconstruction phase two project for $1.1 million in STBG funds, and University Heights' Sunset Street and Melrose Avenue project for $225,000 in STBG funds. Iowa City's Burlington Street Highway 1 Bridge Improvements Project for $7.3 million in STBG money was also awarded funding, but due to funding target constraints, the project was programmed in FY28 and will be included in next year's FY25 to 28 TIP. The transit portion of the TIP includes operating funding and projects from the transit program of projects, which includes mainly buses and equipment replacement, as well as funding for new transit facilities for all three of our transit agencies. Buses are usually replaced using 85% federal funding with 15% local match. 
Since the draft TIP was approved at your May meeting, a few changes have taken place. Uh, Coralville and North Liberty are doing a joint project, uh, Forever Green Road extension. They received federal earmarked funds in the amount of $2.5 million. The project cost is currently estimated at around $18 million, and they're looking to start spending the money in FY24. So that project was added into our current 24-27 uh, TIP that we're looking to have you adopt today. Iowa DOT requested a few non-substantive changes which have been addressed. All Iowa DOT projects in our planning area also are included in the TIP, and all local projects will continue to be programmed and completed according to federal guidelines as they have been in the past. In addition to the project list, the TIP also includes project status reports, identifies regionally significant projects, the MPO's public input process, the MPO's project selection procedures used for STBG and TAP projects, including the scoring criteria, a fiscal constraint review of the TIP projects, financial analysis of transit projects, and statements regarding performance-based planning measures for highway safety, pavement and bridge, freight reliability, transit asset management, and transit safety. The MPO published a TIP public hearing notice in the Gazette and Press, Press Citizen 30 days in advance of today's meeting per our uh, PPP. All agencies on the MPO's public input list were contacted. Public notice posters were placed on all fixed route buses regarding today's meeting. And given all of that, we still did not receive any public comment regarding the TIP. Um, so today, staff is requesting approval of the final FY24-27 TIP, and we will submit the final document to Iowa DOT, FHWA, and FTA by its due date, July 15th. I can take any questions you have. I just want to jump in quick, too. Um, you, some of you may know or have seen in the paper that Iowa City received about $23 million in raise funds for a new transit facility and some new uh, electric buses. Coralville also received, was it $2, two million, give or take, I think, in raise funds for, uh, for electric buses as well. And while we don't know exactly what needs to be in this document with respect to those funds, we think we have it in there. So um, it's likely that none of those funds will be spent this year anyway, but we think we've got our bases covered. So. Um, Kudos to Hannah for figuring that out on short notice. No other questions? Okay, thanks, Hannah. This is a uh, public hearing. Is, welcome to uh, hear any public comment or questions regarding the um, what we're considering. Anyone wish to speak? Okay, I'm going to close the public hearing and uh, ask that we consider a resolution adopting the fiscal year 24-27 transportation improvement program for the Iowa City urbanized area and authorizing the MPO chairperson to sign associated documents contained therein. May I have a motion, please? Move to adopt. Oh. <laughs> I'll second. Great, thanks. Any, uh, any discussion on this item? So hearing none, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> that motion passes. Thank you. Thanks. And the, the second consideration is to consider a resolution certifying compliance with federal requirements for conducting the urban transportation planning process in the Iowa City urbanized area. Can I have a motion, please? I'll move. Second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Not hearing any. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? And that motion passes. Thank you. All right. So we're, we're on to um, the next item under transportation planning. And Ken is giving an update on the Crandick Bus Rapid Transit Study for us. Yeah, so I think everyone in the room is aware I've given an update on this several times. Uh, we completed a series of three um, passenger rail studies on the Crandick corridor roughly from North Liberty down to South Iowa City uh, several years back. And then last fall, the board gave approval to move forward with a bus rapid transit study in the same corridor, uh, given approximately the same extents. 
Um, since that time, I've been working with your respective entities to try and figure out how to fund that study. Uh, we have not come to a consensus thus far, um, which is a little disappointing, but I think we'll get there. Uh, I do have a meeting next to, well, July 18th, I believe that's next Tuesday, um, to discuss the to discuss how we're going to fund the study. So a um, little bit discouraging, but I think we'll get there and uh, still hoping that if we can get that moving along, we'll have the study done hopefully around the first of the year, if not given any more delays. Just a reminder for us, Kent, who, what were the entities that you're, that you've approached for funding? So, you know, that's a good question. So I approached the same five entities that helped fund the passenger rail studies. So that's the county, the university, Coralville, North Liberty, and Iowa City, uh, leaving out University Heights and Tiffin mostly just because they would benefit less and just because the communities are small enough that uh, harder for them to come up with the funding to, to make that match. Uh, the study is the, the selected consultant. Uh, currently, the study is about $250,000, um, which is about the same uh, cost of the three passenger rail studies. Can you share the, the consultant? I'd rather not share the consultant okay. name just because we don't <laughs> have a contract yet. Uh, we're still trying to figure out the funding, um, but they are very reputable and they have worked in the community before for several uh, entities in the room. Are they, <clears throat> would they be able to do the engineering assessment of that to see if it's even technically possible? Because yeah. It seems it, to be, you know, we don't want to go too far down the road if, if the, you know, right. exactly. they say you, you can't do that. Right. Um, I think we could. My hope is that we'll be able to just find the funding and just move forward with the study because I think it's, um, I think it's probably more valuable, but that's a good point. And if we get to a point where we can't fund the study or, or we choose not to fund the study, um, we can certainly start looking at what would be most beneficial to us just to make a, a quicker decision. So a question. Clarification, and I think this is maybe in line with your question. We are talking about the rail becoming a pathway for bus and Correct. Correct. Okay. Yep. And, and for me, I've been so frustrated about this. How many studies are we going to do and fund before? I mean, you right. got a lot of information from that. Right. the last studies, yep. um, quite a bit. Isn't there a certain amount of overlap from that? Even though we're talking about a different mode of transportation, the, the path is the same. The stops would presumably be the same. Right. So I would think that um, you could utilize a lot of that information from yep. before. And I sure hope you would because that was not cheap. And, yeah, no, definitely. Um, no, that's a good point. And I share in your frustration with just with getting through this. Um, I will say that we have, there certainly is some overlap. And I think the, the selected consultant is taking that into account. Um, when we put together the request for a proposal, we also shared it with all three transit agencies. That did not happen with the first study because the transit agencies would not operate a, a rail system. That would have been Cranick Railroad that would have mm -hmm. operated that for us or some someone they would hire to operate it for us. The idea with this study, since it's essentially just a new roadway that would operate with a bus rather than uh, a passenger rail car, would be that one of the three local agencies would likely take over uh, ownership of that, so to speak, and run that. So um, when we had the request for proposal uh, written, we had all three transit agencies look at that, and they actually added a few things to the study as well. So it isn't just the study minus some overlap. It's actually the study plus a little bit as well that they so wanted to add. What three transit agencies? So Coralville Transit, Iowa City Transit, and CAM bus. Okay. Yep. So what happens if there's not a consensus reached next Tuesday? I don't know the answer to that. I think we can get there. Um, you know, my, and part of my frustration has been, you know, I think, you know, the board gave us direction to move forward with this project. You know, this isn't an MPO uh, project, so to speak. This is something the board asked us to do. Um, you know, my frustration is just a little bit, if, we, if we're having this much trouble getting $250,000 to study this, what will it take to actually get a project implemented, you know, for, 20, 30, 40, 60 million dollars, you know, whatever that price tag might be. So I'm a little bit, um, I have a little bit of frustration with it as well, but uh, I think we can come up with a plan. Uh, I do know, and I've talked to Laura about this, that there is some interest in spending down some of the MPO reserve funds to pay for this, which we have and we can do. Um, my one reservation with doing that is, you know, the Swishers, the Shueyvilles, Lone Trees, they also pay into our organization. So some of those funds are theirs as well. And arguably, they wouldn't be at the seat making the decision to spend the, fun the funds and arguably don't benefit as much from this service um, 
as of course the metro area would. So I, I have a little bit of issue with that. Um, but if that's the direction the board wants to give me later, then then we can do that. And what are the endpoints of this? So up to Swisher or beyond? No, it would actually just be the North, basically Penn Street and North Liberty to essentially Burlington Street and Iowa City, give or take, depending on where the, the location of the actual stop would be. Well, at least you're going into North Liberty now. <laughs> yep. So I think there's a path forward. Um, like I say, I have a little, I have some reservation with using, it, it's sort of unprecedented. And what it does is the reserve funds that the MPO has keeps assessments down, right? So different than most community budgets, it's sort of a use it or lose it budget, right? You budget so much funding for a department, if they don't need the funds, the funds then either transfer back into a, a general fund or just sit there for the next year. Because we work on assessment based schedule where we actually, you know, essentially invoice each one of your communities or entities. Um, it's hard to give those funds back. It's just not really worthwhile since we're going to send you another bill the next year. So those funds go into our reserves and then we spend those reserves down to keep assessments down the following year. It's just the easiest way to do that. Um, and they have grown a little bit. Um, I would say we probably have about 200,000 in excess reserves right now. Um, but again, uh, that's if, if we, if we dip into that and spend it on a study, it's not there to hold assessments sort of flat in the future. And what entity would you need to approve dipping into that reserve? Is it this board or some other group? No, it would be this board. Yeah. So I guess I would just turn to all of you then and say, okay, we are all frustrated with how long the let's look at evaluating this. If we think that having transportation on this corridor is a priority and is something that we want to pursue, let's figure it out. I mean, you know, I know Iowa City's in. I think the county is in. We've been in. Yeah. yeah. So, All um, four times. And, and the other I guess thing, I'm looking at North Liberty and Coralville then. <laughs> and the other thing I would say is, you know, $250,000 is real money. No, no doubt. I don't dispute that. I, I do find it hard to believe, though, that between five entities, we can't come up with $250,000. So, again, it, it, I understand everyone's position, and um, it, this wasn't necessarily budgeted funding either. Uh, so, I do respect that. But, um, you know, I'm hopeful that, again, if we're really serious about this, we can find the funding and, and get the project done. Kent, does the, would the study include an uh, analysis of how this system would impact land use at the stations? We, we have asked for that, and it's included in the RFP. It is a very hard thing, I think, for consultants to put their finger on. Um, we asked for the same thing in the passenger rail study, and the consultant did their best. I don't think they did a wonderful job, um, but it is a hard thing for them to put their finger on. It is included in our FP, uh, so they'll do the best they can. I will say the consultant has a lot of experience with this, so I think it'll be easier for them to maybe uh, work through that than it was the passenger rail folks. They have experience with it. There's just less experience in the United States with passenger rail than there is bus rapid transit. I mean, the, part of the reason I ask is if, if we are going to be asking for millions of dollars to actually implement having an understanding of what right. potential value the system will have at the stations might help people jump on board. Yep, agreed. So I think, John, you're referring to like a transit-oriented development, I think, is, Correct. is what we call yeah. it. So, you know, where you've got these seven or nine different stops, uh, if there's vacant land there or maybe blighted uh, properties, those properties immediately increase in value um, and then taxable value. It's, it's a road, major so public investment. I mean, I, I don't know where all the stations are, but I, I mean, I drive through Oakdale and the university lands there, I would think would tremendously benefit mm -hmm. from having this system. So Absolutely. again, I don't know how that applies to all the stations, but that's what like, the bus rapid transit could do. So, Kent, you said the excess reserves are about 200000 Yeah, so right now we've got something like $500,000 in reserves. Um, we try to target and keep about 35% of our budget back for a rainy day, so to speak, anyway. Um, and that's since, we, since we're a department of the city of Iowa City, that's sort of their rule of thumb is 35%. That puts us somewhere around 300000 so that leaves us with about $200,000 in excess funds. Maybe that would get entities on board if that was committed to this project, then that would be a total of $50,000 that the five entities would need to cough up, or are we only talking three entities? Uh, five entities total, 50000 a piece was the ask for a total of two fifty. 
Um, if we, you know, I, I could see a scenario where everybody kicks in 25,000 instead, and then we, you know, essentially dip into the MPO reserve for 125,000. I think that's what some folks are thinking. Um, so I could see that path forward. So my point is that if you have the um, practice of use it or lose it on those reserve funds, minus the 35%, if you commit now to using it for this project, then that price tag looks a lot more reachable for reluctant entities. And I personally would like to see that commitment from MPO. Given that the Rural Policy Board only meets annually in January and would not have an opportunity to uh, vote on dipping into the reserves, I'd like to see it a little less than 125. Uh, but I, I would support 100,000 from reserves uh, up to 100,000 uh, to at least show some deference to those folks. Yeah, and as we talked about at the beginning of the meeting, we may not meet in September. I mean, we could certainly meet. We can call a meeting and at any time and discuss anything we like, but it may just be that item if we need to call a meeting for it, um, which then gets a little bit tricky to get quorums and that sort of thing. So, um, I, you know, and then if, if our next meeting's not till November, we're months off. So I, it, it gets a little bit tricky with the timeline. I do think that we are good problem solvers here. And I think that we, if there's a consensus to authorize a certain amount of reserves, even if that transfer isn't authorized until November, you could move forward in your conversations with the other entities who can probably front the cash and make sure it can happen. We talked about trying to have this study done by the end of this year. So right. the idea of us tinkering around and thinking, oh, do we want to talk about it in November is really shouldn't shouldn't be acceptable to us. Yeah, and then one one thing that I would probably do, so so let's say, I mean, the board could give me direction tonight that we can spend X amount on reserve funds, and, and that's fine. My only reservation is that the public hasn't had a chance to talk about this either. Um, we may be able to work through that and hold a, you know, advertise for a special workshop or something where we can provide, provide information to the public. I think that would be fine, uh, but I would like them, the public, to at least have the opportunity as well. And I have another question regarding it going as far north as Penn. Um, with the growth of North Liberty, there's quite a bit of population beyond that. Um, so was the decision to stop at Penn based on the parking lot that ADM uses the line for, Crandic line for, or was there another factor in that decision? Yeah, no. So. I would call it approximate. So what we have in the request is actually just looking at that corridor roughly from Penn Street to Burlington <laughs> Street. But if the consultant says, hey, you've got this opportunity a quarter mile north of Penn Street or even a mile north of Penn Street for whatever reason, we would rely on them to tell us that information. So it's not locked in at all. It's just uh, roughly from point A to point B. So is there would, are historic stops right? Um, when it was an inner urban yep. beyond that and the population has grown? No, it's a good point. We would look at the consultant and tell us, you know, hey, you should really be extending this another half mile or whatever that might be. And, and before the first time we did a study, um, it was up to Forever Green and there was a lot of um, displeasure expressed at North Liberty for not jumping on board. And, and I <laughs> said, why would they? It doesn't even go into their into their city limits. This does... But when you're leaving off the north chunk of their city limits, perhaps there would be more buy-in if they knew that more, you know, it would go beyond that. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think, yes, what happened with the stopping of Forever Green, I think, was a symptom of North Liberty not being interested, not <coughs> stopping there before they became interested. Okay. So what do folks think about giving Kent some idea of our comfort level with using the reserve so we can try and move this forward as soon as possible if we have a consultant that we want to hire. Because we have a consultant we want to hire. I, I, would, I would support that. If I can jump in real quick, I think the easiest, and this is, this is great, I think the easiest way probably for me to work into my meeting next week, if, if you are all interested in kind of a pre-approval, would probably be for half, which would be 125000 
if it's not, then we just, you know, I, I think that would probably be the easiest way. I mean, we'll take whatever direction you give us, but that is probably just the slickest way to do it, I would think. And I think what we're talking about is if if something like this were f is viable, that's our question, right? Is this viable? We know that it will be an asset for the region. I appreciate, you know, for for those rural communities that may not be, they may not receive the transit oriented oriented development immediate land use kind of uh, value to it. But the concept of moving people north and south in the corridor when we spend hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars on adding lanes to 380. Like this, this is a really acute problem that I think everyone in the region knows needs to be solved. And I would just hate for us to, to you know, miss the opportunity based on really a few thousand dollars at this point. So good with half? I would be good with half, but I actually would like to know, um, and I, I appreciate your thoughts there, John, on the, the rural communities not having a significant say um, until much later. But um, you did say that if you don't use it, you lose it. Do you have a plan for the other half? No, we will not lose these funds. I, I, I was saying the that reserves. for unlike communities where it's sort of use it, you're lose, oh. use it or lose it, our funds just stay. They just stay, yeah. okay. Because otherwise we would have to give checks back to communities. So we just hold it and then we just okay. use it for the next budget and, and then we just yeah. Keep that process. Because otherwise I'd say let's go for more. Right. Yeah. No, these are these are local <laughs> funds, so they don't have an expiration date. They're not tied to anything at this point. The next Can you tell I want to get this done? <laughs> What's that? Can you tell I want to get this done? I can't. <laughs> the next fiscal year we will just be assessing our entities a little bit more than otherwise, potentially. Um, but you know, um potentially, but we'll still have some excess funds and we still are within we still have that thirty five percent as well, sort of for a rainy day fund. So I the other thing to mention is just that our budget has actually gone down the last two or three years just because of staff turnover. Um, we have we have newer mm -hmm. staff. So we've actually, our budget's actually gone down the last two or three years. So I don't think there's a, an emergency by any stretch of the imagination for our budget. I mean, I think our budget's pretty sound. Um, it's just unprecedented. And I just want to be completely clear that, you know, we don't normally dip into these funds and we can. Um, but someday, you know, five years down the road, maybe we will be in a position where we do need to crank assessments up a little bit more. So As one one thing too that um, is a time factor for us is we're using ARPA funds, and they mm -hmm. have to be obligated by December thirty first, twenty twenty four, and obligated is defined by U.S. Treasury as a contract in place or an invoice. Yep. So will that is that timing? Is that going to happen? Yeah, so long as we come forward? up with the, the 250000 however we come up with it, uh, that we already have um, a contract. We just have not signed it. And it's good for six months, and we're probably at least a couple months into that. So the contract's still good. Um, everything should be fine, and we would easily have that under contract. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could have a contract signed in the next few weeks if we had uh, funding authority. Thank you. Kent, can you remember the last time you used the reserve funds? I don't think it's ever been used, to my knowledge, at least not since I've been here, and certainly not since I've been the director. Um, yeah, I don't think we've ever used it okay. for this type of thing. And that's what makes me just a little bit queasy about it. But at the end of the day, I mean, there's plenty of funding there. And again, our you know the, the entire MPO budget right now is about $700,000 split um, between all the entities. So, you know, the any increase in an assessment because we've used these funds is going to be fairly small for communities just because it's a fairly small budget. So it's not a, I don't think there'll be any sticker shock because of it. And if there, and even if assessments did go up, it would likely be a few years if, if, if it's a result of the use of these funds. I mean, it, we're talking a few years down the road for sure. Okay. A couple of other points to, to make. Um, uh, historically North Liberty hasn't been crazy about these studies because it didn't actually get into the city. Right. Um, there wasn't a landing spot at Forever Green Road. There's physically no place for a train station to have been located there. So it seemed kind of um, pointless on our part to participate in this uh, for funding. But the um, issue we have right now really is just the percentage ask per city has or entity has been cleanly defined as the same dollar amount per entity, which in our opinion isn't fair either. Um, the University of Iowa has uh, a location at the south and also at the north of this corridor. 
Um, they seem to be the largest entity that should be funding more of this. Um, we definitely have an interest in being part of this study. Um, it's that model right there. So um, Ryan has been involved in these conversations with Kent for your information and um, was looking forward to this conversation on Tuesday. That's been our sticking point um, is that the allocation hasn't been in any other way other than just divide it by five. We don't make decisions and spend money at the MPO just dividing it by five. We divide it by the population of the cities, uh, the number of riders uh, on the buses when we're giving out money. So we would look for that type of an allocation or a request of these funds from the entities to pitch in for it. So that's where we were. If there's been any doubt uh, or wondering why we're not officially on that list, that's why. Thank you. If that was the model you used, though, I think that it would significantly reduce the amount that the county would pay in um, simply because we're going mostly through incorporated areas. Um, and yes, while they're in the county, it's not uh, the unincorporated part. So I, I think that maybe, maybe there's a happy medium somewhere, and I don't know what that is. And I think that's what Kent has been organizing mm -hmm. um, with our with our representatives and mayors, or not mayors, but city staff Correct. over the last number of weeks. Correct. Yep. So we've got. So I appreciate that. We've got uh, the three city managers from North Liberty, Coralville, and Iowa City uh, that'll be represented at the meeting next week, and then Rod and John Green, uh, just because they're members of this board, um, on that on that. Uh, Zoom call as well. All right. Would you like a motion, Mr. Chairman? Regarding the allocation of the funds? Ken, did you want to have a I, have that now? or I think as long, I mean, it, I don't think it necessarily needs to be an emotion. I think if, if we have support, and I sense there might be for up to one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars worth of reserve funds. I think if I get head nods from everyone, then I'm then I feel good about that. Okay. So head nods, please. <laughs> so head nods to use uh, excess reserve funds and up to the amount of one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. Okay, okay, that's great. That'll be helpful for our conversation next week. All right, good. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. That brings us to uh, other business. Uh, I just had a couple quick things. Um, one, just to keep everybody up to speed, uh, the urban area boundary, uh, we've been contacted by the DOT and because of the 2020 census, they're just now getting to the urban area boundary, which I struggled with, but is primarily used for like statistical analysis. It's really not used for much else than that. Just ways to compare our urban area to other urban areas across the country. Um, Long story short, that urban area needs to change the boundary uh, because mm -hmm. of the census. And what we have established uh, at the MPO, and we'll likely be bringing this to you um, either yet this fall, or we can also have the chair just sign off on it, is actually just expanding. Uh, rather than contracting the urban area boundary, which is what's being suggested by the TOT, we can just use what we have now and just add the new areas that have actually been identified by uh, the census folks, essentially. So, um, it's sort of much ado about nothing. Uh, the only thing it affects for the MPO is our federal functional classified streets, um, which is where we can spend our funding. But again, we're not we're not really looking to contract it. I think we'll just expand that and then nothing really changes for us. But just want to let you know that we will be working on that um, with your respective communities. The other thing I wanted to mention really quickly is there is a DOT ribbon cutting uh, that was sent to some of your administrations. And I just wanted to mention it's for the 8380 interchange. Uh, after all these years, we are getting close to completing that. And there'll be a ribbon cutting August 25th at 10 o'clock. Location to be determined. Still, Kathy, is that right? Okay. So location to be determined, and I'll make sure to get that out to you guys as well. Uh, but mark your calendars if interested, August 25th, 10 a.m. <laughs> Uh, and then lastly, I just wanted to mention that at all of your seats was a printed copy of the agenda. I wanted to provide a video link. So in the under other business, there's a video link that was recommended by uh, John uh, for your interest. And I don't know if John, if you wanted to say anything about it. What, just briefly, uh, this, is, this is a video link to uh, a, a posting that was on the Active Towns podcast, if you're familiar with that, or website. 
uh, and it was it was covering a uh, in res- it was kind of in a, res- a conversation between the founder of Strong Active Towns and um, uh, this individual from Australia who's involved in transportation planning there, uh, who had both attended the um, v- Velo City, which is an annual event that takes place uh, in various cities around the world. It's a global perspective on transportation planning, uh, which I found very interesting uh, because it, it is sort of elevates the conversation to a global scale. And, and you, for me, it was kind of inspiring to see what, 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 I'm, what I saw in other countries in terms of their achievements, the level to which, you know, they're, they're reaching, um, you know, developing trans- transportation systems that really work well for everyone. And some, I thought some fabulous photos of just, you know, kids, kids riding their bikes kind of, I don't know, some of you saw the first video back in January that I shared with you all. Um, but, you know, the, the very young and the very old taking advantage of the transportation systems that they have in their countries. And uh, I, I suggested to Kent that maybe he should be going to one of these fellow city events because, you know, I don't, you can't help but come back inspired by what you see. Or depressed, depending, <laughs> or depressed, and then you know, excited about what you might be able to achieve. Uh, so anyway, I just put it down there for your enjoyment, and if you have the time and to check it out, I think it's a good website too for this general topic of transportation. Yeah, I was able to watch it last night, and is if you get nothing else from it, it does feel good. Yeah. yeah. All right, good. So we're on to um, asking for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes. We are adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.